Good morning and welcome to St Mary's. It's lovely that you've joined us online for this service. Uh, if this is your first time with us, an especially warm welcome to you. And if you're a regular, we're delighted that you're here with us again. Now this morning we're continuing our teaching series of Faith That Works, which is looking at what the Bible has to say about how faith works when the world doesn't. And this time we're looking at how faith works when facing an uncertain future. Now I'm assuming that this is pretty relevant to most people at this time. Now this Sunday also marks the start of Advent, the period of four Sundays before Christmas, and the season that reminds Christians of the coming of Christ, first as a baby in a manger, and now in anticipation of his second coming as judge of the world. And later Alan will offer a short reflection on the significance of Advent and will light the first of our Advent candles. But we're going to begin with some worship, and my heartfelt prayer is in that in this time together, uh, we're going to discover more of who God is, and that we are going to be encouraged in whatever situation we find ourselves in. So shall we pray? Heavenly Father, I simply pray that by your power you will reveal more of who you are. Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit to touch us afresh this morning. Lord God, might we go away from this time together changed and encouraged and in a fuller knowledge of who you really are. And so I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Will be 
Financial markets hate uncertainty, or so the saying goes. It strikes me, though, that the great majority of people hate uncertainty. And yet this is what we're living through now and have been since March. But to be honest, we're always living through uncertainty. The difference now is that the uncertainty in life is palpable and disruptive and it's beyond our control, whereas usually uncertainty is something we consciously or unconsciously are trying to control. Life is full of uncertainty and yet, and I think this is a strong Western trait, many think, even believe, that they have the right to control it and so unwittingly live in the mirage of security. That is, they're putting their trust in the systems of this world. Now, one of my great privileges in life has been to travel quite extensively, most often in countries and regions where security is not high on people's minds. Bizarrely, almost perversely, in such places I routinely meet people who exhibit more joy and live with a certain kind of carefree attitude to life uh, that you don't see in those in the worried West. Many of these people have been people of faith, uh, and one of the most effective antidotes to fear and anxiety that is due from the uncertainty about the future is to know the end of the story. Presumably that's why so much story has been put into and, and kind of hopeful relief and expectation is being placed in finding a successful vaccine to get the world out of this recurring, wretched COVID nightmare. But the reality is this. Once we're through this trial, another one will be coming down the line, possibly not as intense, but it will be coming. The answer then is not to try and escape the situation, Rather, it's to learn how to live in the situation and in the circumstances that we're experiencing. Now, there's much wisdom in the Bible about how to do this and how you can know the end of the story. Then it really is possible to live with hope and have a clearer understanding and framework for explaining what is taking place now. It's why, for the Christian, there's this line in the film The Best Exotic Marigold Hotel that says this, everything will be all right in the end. If it's not all right, then it's not the end. And, and this one line bears profound theological truths that are way beyond the context of the film itself. So it's to this subject that James turns in his short, helpful letter in the New Testament that we're working our way through. And it's so helpful to our situation now. Now, if you haven't read it, I'd urge you to go and do so. The wisdom it contains is priceless and could begin to transform your life from the point you start applying uh, it to your life. So this morning in our series of Faith That Works, we're looking at how faith works when facing an uncertain future. And so we're going to continue reading from James chapter 4, verses 13 through to 17. It reads, Now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. COVID-19 has been a wake-up call for many, even though there have been warnings of such a pandemic striking our unsuspecting world. It's come way too close to our own front door and rudely interrupted our daily experience of life. One of the most common ways, well, that's for those I'd suggest who live in developed nations, is to try and protect yourself from any such eventuality taking place now or again in the future. And one key tool at our disposal is to ensure ourselves, our health, our possessions, our livelihoods, in fact, anything and everything. But COVID-19 has shown us and should be a stark warning to us that there are forces beyond our control 
in which we have no way, absolutely no way of controlling. It would be lovely to be able to say that we're in control, but that is a mirage, though many might try and convince you otherwise. The blunt reality is this, you basically have no way of knowing what will happen in your life over the next few years, let alone the next five minutes. You cannot know, for instance, for, uh, for instance or are able to predict whether your heart will stop pumping before I stop talking. You do not know whether a car will come careering down the wrong side of the road the next time you get in your car and drive somewhere. You do not know whether your investments or your pension fund will be safe and secure, or whether it's going to be rocked by a stock market crash. And of course, you do not know the next time you sit down for a meal in a restaurant, whether there's a deadly virus there. So what can we do? I want to give us four principles from the Bible for how to live easy when facing an uncertain future. There are three don'ts and one do. So the first one. There's so much wisdom in the Bible, I'm amazed people are reluctant to read it and then apply it to their lives. Take, for example, Ecclesiastes 8 verse 7, it says this, Since no one knows the future, who can tell someone else what is to come? Why try kidding yourself otherwise, or agonise over trying to work it out, or even spending money asking others to find out uh, kind of your future for you? The bottom line is the Bible teaches that uh, teaches us that no one can know for sure what is going to happen next in your life. Now, in our reading, we heard of merchants, businessmen, putting a plan together. Now, it looks to be a good plan. There's nothing wrong with having a plan. They're making travel plans. They have a destination. They're going to stay there for a certain amount of time. They're going to open up a business. They plan to make a profit. There doesn't seem to be anything obviously wrong with this plan. But, and it's a big but, they are making plans without reference to God. First point then, don't make plans without asking God. Time and again, as you read scripture, you discover that to have God's blessing, we are to involve him in our planning. So at its most obvious, the Christian is to pray as you plan your life. Now we've read previously in James's letter from the opening chapter, uh, chapter one, verse five, if any of you lacks wisdom, that is if you want to know what God wants you to do, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. And verses that are very precious to me and that I try and build my life upon are these from Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. That's Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6. Second, and this one is likely to hit hard, especially if you're a, what I want to call a product of the West. Second, don't presume that you'll have tomorrow. We see this in verses 14 through to 16. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. We've already mentioned there's an arrogance, almost a kind of a defiance of death, that in the West it's something that shouldn't happen until and unless we say it can or will be. Now, this is not a mindset found in many places in the world. James says it's boastful and it's arrogant, it's, it's sinful. Perhaps it's little surprise that you often see in those who have had a brush with death a greater sense of the value that they then place on life and a recognition that life is just a mist that is here for a little while and then vanishes. That is why the wise live one day at a time and make it count. The writer of the Proverbs rightly says, 27 verse 1, do not boast about tomorrow for you do not 
know what a day may bring. And why, when Jesus teaching his disciples about the futility of worrying about an uncertain future said, Matthew 6, 34, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Thirdly, and we see this in verse 17, don't put off doing what's right and good. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Perhaps think of it this way, don't procrastinate, don't put things off, don't delay. Now we're probably even more prone to this in this season because of the sense of acedia that many are feeling and I talked about last week. Uh, I know this is uh, something that I'm kind of experiencing myself. You might find it helpful to go back and watch last week's talk if you haven't done already. There are surely clear resonances with Jesus' teaching in the parable of the rich fool in Luke 12, who was rebuked for worldly planning and hoarding wealth to spend on his own pleasures, only to die suddenly and leave behind all that he had to someone else. James is surely reminding us that if a person takes God into account, they might not focus solely on trying to increase their own standard of living. Rather, God might leave them to, say, relieve the suffering that's around them and to do good. I mean, clearly this has bearing on the UK government's recent decision to reduce the amount of overseas aid it gives. Here in James, it's a sober reminder, if one is needed, that our tendency when we think of sin is to those things that we've willfully done wrong, i.e., sins of commission, as they're technically referred to, rather than to reflect on our sins of omission, those things that we have failed or omitted to do. So, we are to do whatever we have to do, and to do it now. Fourth, earlier we talked about a crucially important aspect for how faith works when we're facing an uncertain future. It's to know the end of the story because when you do, as a Christian, you can live with genuine hope and have a clearer picture and framework for explaining what is taking place right now. The good news of Christianity is that it does offer a clear and thorough understanding of the world we live in and how you and I fit into it. As a scientist, my conclusion is the Christian faith presents the most logical explanation for how creation came into being, how it is sustained, what is going to happen at the end of time. And it goes a long way to answering questions such as, why is there so much pain and suffering in our world? Christianity's view of history is not that it's going round in a never-ending cycle, but that it's all headed towards a glorious crescendo when Jesus will return again as Lord and King. It's why Christians celebrate Advent, this period before Christmas that reminds us of the coming of Christ first as a baby and now in anticipation of his second coming as judge of the world. The Bible explains what these last days, the period we're currently living in, will be like and what we might expect to see in terms of how people act and behave towards each other. For instance, James encourages Christians to be patient and to stand firm. While the Apostle Paul, writing to his close friend Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 verses 1 through to 5 says, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And acknowledging this, Peter exhorts, exhorts Christians uh, in 2 Peter 3, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Putting all this together, Christians are urged to live and to prepare for his coming again and to look forward with eager anticipation to the glorious future that is the inheritance promised for believers in Christ. So as I close, I want to challenge you. 
if you're not a Christian, I would urge you to consider the claims of Christianity and the knowledge that your loving Heavenly Father is waiting with arms wide open for you to return to him. And if you're a person of faith, and if you've given your life to Christ, don't be a bystander, someone who kind of stays on the side in, in the bleachers uh, with regard to this great story of the gospel that is ours. Jump into the story right now and start living it as fully as you possibly can, recognising that it is foolish to make plans, though, without reference to God. Make the most of every day, as you do not know what tomorrow brings. And don't put off to another day doing what is right and good now. So shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you just for the opportunity we've had to look again into the scripture, into the Bible, uh, into what James has to say to us. And Father, I simply pray that we might take away uh, what is helpful to us today. Lord God, might we live our life in the knowledge that you are returning one day. Lord, that we might live our life by making plans that acknowledge you and recognising that life is a gift and that wherever we can, we will do good. And so I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Today is the first Sunday of Advent, a sort of countdown to Christmas. Over the coming weeks, we're going to be lighting the candles in our Advent wreath and offering a short explanation as to their significance, plus a prayer of thanksgiving for the men and women of the scriptures who, over many generations, have inspired people of faith. One thing they each have in common is a willingness to venture into the unknown, both physically and figuratively, in order to prepare the way for the Christ child to enter this world. The first candle is lit to remind us of the ones we call the patriarchs, people like Abraham and Sarah, their son Isaac and his son Jacob. It was Abraham who first entered into a covenant relationship with God and in obedience he left the place of his birth to travel to a place that God had prepared for his people. And so we pray, God of Abraham and Sarah and all the patriarchs of old, you are our Father too. Your love is revealed in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of David. Help us as we prepare to celebrate his birth, to make our hearts ready for your Holy Spirit to make his home among us. We ask this through Jesus Christ, who is coming into the world. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed your time this morning and look forward to welcoming you back again. Now, if you'd like to find out more about what happens at St Mary's, please do join us again online for other services and take a moment to fill out one of our Get Connected cards if you haven't done so already. Now, we've heard some challenging things this morning, so if you'd like to explore more about the claims of the Christian faith, Alpha is a great place to do that. If you'd like to join our next course or have any questions about it, please email alpha at stmarysperly.com. Dot org dot uk. Alternatively, if you're interested with meeting with others in a small group and growing in your faith, Connect Groups offer a great opportunity for doing this. And again, do get in contact with us. Following on from this service, there's going to be a gathering on Zoom to connect and meet with others and to reflect on our topic this morning. So once the service is finished, please make yourself a coffee and then join with others online. The connection details will be displayed at the end of the service. But now, let me close with a blessing for Advent. Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you, scatter the darkness from before your path, and make you ready to meet him when he comes in glory, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.